Well, good morning. Good morning. See everybody here with us today. Maybe you're visiting with us, and we, it's our delight to have you here with us. And if you are visiting with us, would you do me a favor? Would you scan that QR code up on the screen? And that'll give you a way to connect with us, or you can text the word welcome to 803 590 1975. And that'll help you get connected with us, and we can know that you're here visiting with us. If you'd like to stay more connected and be in a part of the loop and get information sent out to you, would you scan that QR code there to be a part of the loop? Or you can text the word loop to 803 590 1975. We do have a couple of announcements. We get to have a meal today, so please stick around for the opportunity to help support our kids going to camp and also enjoy a time of fellowship together. So that will be immediately following the service today. Our hospitality team has worked very hard on this, and so just please stick around and, and join in that time, especially if you don't have any meal plans. And if you if you do, call them and say, hey, won't you come join us over here? And then we'll be able to have that time together. But let's all just plan on that and sticking around there. And also just remembering in the kids, there will be no uh, kids on mission tonight. So that's just a secondary um Announcement there for kids a reminder that there will be no kids on mission tonight And we do have a couple of family meetings coming up And so we do have one next week and there is information for you as far as the vote for our HVAC unit That is on the table in the welcome center to my left at the, at the back of the room here at the back of the sanctuary And so you can pick one of those up and be able to see what the property team is proposing and be able to stick around next week Just for a short time to be able to vote on that and then we will have a, a regular scheduled family meeting on the 15th of May. So hope that you guys can, can join in on both of those and, and stick around to be a part of those family meetings. We invite you now, if you would, to please join me in the word of prayer. Father, we <coughs> come before your throne. And Lord, we, we are in all of you. Lord, as we are reminded constantly of who you are. Lord, our, our God forever, the one and only, our creator, our savior, our sustainer, our all in all. There's nothing that we can do, Lord, to save ourselves. You do it all. Lord, that you give us a beautiful way to live that you prescribe for us. You say, if we will follow after that way, will go well for us. Doesn't mean there won't be persecution, because there will be. But what it does mean is that we'll be able to be united, proclaiming your truths and proclaiming your word. And so Lord, I pray that you will guide us in that. Lord, as you pray that we will be one, as you and the Father are one, may that be so. May our focus be on the mission is we're banded together. And I'm carrying your gospel to people who need you, whom you can be saved for, and you alone. And so we give you all praise. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. 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 you please to stand as we sing together. You alone can rescue us.
to read these words of scripture with me. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest, and make an offering for your cleansing, as Moses commanded for a proof to them. But now even more the report about him went abroad, and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities. As we were reminded this week at our conference, the one who is clean, the one who is clean has the power to clean the one who's unclean. And thus, who are unclean can come to the one who is clean. And he attributes that cleanness to us just by faith. Because he is the one who makes a way for us to be with him forever. Let's so let's sing together, Waymaker.
if you don't know if this is, is it on? Oh, yeah. okay. I appreciate that Chris and John would trust me to bring God's word. They've been gone for T4G this past week and heard a couple others plans, so I hope that was really encouraging um, to hear more of God's word from some really awesome theologians. Um, I appreciate them giving this opportunity to preach the word. Have you ever considered what is the greatest single threat to human society? Have you ever thought about that? Thought about what is the greatest single threat that is posed to man? There's all these things going on in the world right now. We got COVID, we got war, we got famine, we have all sorts of things going on. But we ever sat back and thought about what is the greatest single threat that is posed to human society? We're going to look at that. Uh, we're going to be in 2 Kings chapter 5 today. If you have a copy of God's Word, let's just go ahead and go straight there. We're going to read through the text, and we're going to walk through it, and then we're going to talk about what it says. Um, so that's kind of the plan. 2 Kings chapter 5. I'm going to pray for us real quick before we get started. Um, I'll let everybody get to the passage real quick. Heavenly God, we praise your name, Lord, that you've brought us here. We praise your name that you have blessed us in so many ways. Heavenly God, I would pray that you would use this time to open our hearts, that you would let your word resonate in our hearts. Let us see you. Let us see your character. Let us see your nature. Let us see your will. Let us see your son, O oh God. We praise your name for your word, that you have blessed us to even have your word, that you've blessed us in the comfortability of this place. I pray that you would let my words, that you would speak through me, let it not be my words, but let it be yours, O oh God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's read through the text real quick. We're going to start right at the beginning, verse or chapter 5, verse 1. So Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and in high favor, because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was a mighty man of valor, but he was a leper. Now the Syrians, on one of their raids, had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who is in Samaria? He would cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his lord, Thus and so spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he went, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent, you to, sent to you Naaman, my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive, that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me, that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored, and you shall be clean. But Naaman was angry and went away, saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Parpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? But are not washing them and be clean? So he turned away and went, he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like that of a little child. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before them. And he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, So now, except now a present from your servant. So Naaman, Naaman is the commander of the Syrian army. He is a high-ranking man. He was a great man in high favor. He's very well-liked. Um, he was held in high favor because of his victories given to him um, in war. It says even, that it's, excuse me, it said that the victories were given to him by God. The text doesn't say why, but he's probably using this to set something up later in his life. It said because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. Now the name Naaman actually means fair, gracious, or pleasant. So if you think about Naaman in general, he's this high, high guy, he's the commander of the Syrian army, he's way up in command, he's 
living in this probably posh lifestyle, if you think about it. It says he's fair, gracious, or pleasant by his name. So he's got everything going on for him, right? Based on his life, it seems like everything is going well for him. But it says he has a problem. He is a leper. Now, leprosy is obviously looked at very different today from the time it was back in the biblical period. So leprosy is a skin disease that affects the skin and the nerves. And people often think leprosy causes limbs to fall off. Um, and it can, in a sense. Uh, but in reality, the limbs basically die over time. Over time, the limbs would slowly die off, the, the nerves would die, the skin would die, eventually leading to amputation. The problem is that leprosy is contagious. It is very contagious. And left untreated, it can lead to severe infection or death. Now, in today's society, it's obviously a little different. We have new technologies. You know that leprosy is much different. But at this point in time, leprosy is a huge problem. Anyone around a leper for a long period of time can get leprosy. That was known. It was not, it was not a secret. So the lifestyle of a leper was very, very different. They were outcasts from society. In Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 explained that a leper had to wear special, they had to tear their clothes and they had to walk around crying unclean everywhere they went so that nobody would get close. So if they're in town, they had to tell everybody, unclean, unclean, they, don't get close to me, I have leprosy. Everywhere they went. Leviticus 13, uh, 45 actually says, he shall dwell alone, outside of the camp shall be his dwelling. So a leper is an outcast that cannot be in the presence of other people. They're completely an outcast at this point in time. Back in this time, that they were a complete outcast. So although Naaman was mighty and held in high favor, the disease ruined everything. All of his positive qualities and his achievements didn't matter. Leprosy changed everything about him and his life. He may have been the commander of the Syrian army, but this leprosy absolutely defined who he was. Let's look a little bit further. So it says um, in verse 2, Now the Syrians on one of their raids had carried off a little girl from the land of Israel, and she worked in the service of Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, Would that my lord were with the prophet who was in Samaria? He would cure him of his leprosy. So we hear about this servant girl that the Syrians took from Israel. She's serving in Naaman's home to his wife. So they're very close at this point, right? This girl is in close proximity to Naaman. If you think about the access that she would have to the family, it's rather great. So she says, there's a prophet in Israel that can heal that leprosy. So you can imagine that Naaman hears this, and he's probably pretty on board, right? Naaman's probably at least fully aware of the magnitude of his situation. At least somewhat. At least somewhat. So you can remember his life is completely affected by this disease. If there is something that can take away this life-altering disease, I would imagine he would probably do it. Wouldn't you? So it says, Naaman goes to the king of Syria and tells him what the little girl says. Verse 4, so Naaman went in and told his lord, thus and so spoke the, girl, spoke the girl from the land of Israel. And the king of Syria said, go now and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he goes and tells the king of Syria what the girl says. And the king seems to be highly supportive of Naaman pursuing this opportunity. He said that he would write a letter to the king of Israel. He is so supportive that he writes a letter to the king of Israel so that the king of Israel won't think that they're trying to trick him. He doesn't want Naaman to show up and be like, get pushed away. If there's an opportunity for him to be healed, we want to make sure that he's not going to get pushed away. So right after that, uh, I think we're still uh, in verse... Five years. So he went with him, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And he brought it the letter to the king of Israel, which read, When this letter reaches you, know that I have sent to you, naming my servant, that you may cure him of his leprosy. So Naaman carries this large sum of money to the king of Israel, right? I actually did the math up for this. Um, back in that time, you know, it, it tells us kind of what the, the value would be a little bit here in the way they looked at it. In today's society, from this is probably about three days ago, that amount of silver would be worth $180,000, and that amount of gold would be worth $4.64 million. So remember, Naaman is very high ranking in the Syrian society. He probably does not see that sum of money the same way we do. 
But there's no doubt this is a great treasure that he's taking with him. He's taking this to the king of Israel. But he can clearly see the underlying motives here. He clearly thought he could purchase his healing. He thought he could purchase this salvation from leprosy. He sees it as a transaction. That's what he sees. The lavish gifts to the king are not only to honor the king of Israel, but to obligate him to heal Naaman. Now remember that they, Naaman lived in a polytheistic society, which means that they worship multiple gods. They no doubt have heard of the God of Israel. You gotta remember everything that's happened at this point. They've been brought out of Egypt, God's part of the seas, he's destroyed other societies that were considered his enemies. The God of Israel has moved greatly at this time. I don't think the Syrians can say, who's the God of Israel? They know. They know. They, but there are no intentions in his heart at this point to recognize him as God or to serve him. He clearly wants to be healed by whomever can offer it. And he's taken a very large treasure to make that happen. So verse 7, And when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make me alive that this man sends word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? Only consider and see how he's seeking a quarrel with me. So we see Naaman traveled to the king of Israel. He arrives to the king of Israel and delivered the letter asking for his healing. And the king reads it. His first reaction, you got to think, he shows up, he hands this letter to the king, and the king's first reaction is, am I God to kill and make alive? He tears his clothes. Tearing of the clothes is a sign of anguish or stress or anxiety. He, is, he immediately ascribes the ability to heal this leprosy as something that only God can do. First thing out of the, out of the gate. That's really interesting, right? He knows he doesn't have this power. What Naaman is asking is almost impossible from the human perspective. The king attributes only to something to God. I do find it interesting that the Bible, though, uses the words to kill and make alive. Clearly, being healed of leprosy was almost like having a new life. Because the king said, kill and make alive. He sees those as stark opposites. So knowing these things, knowing that he attributes this ability to heal leprosy as only something that God can do, the first thing in the king of Israel's mind is this must be a trick. He's trying to seek a quarrel with me. He's trying to trick me. Let's read a little further. Verse 8, but when Elisha heard, or when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he said to the king, saying, why have you torn your clothes? Let him come now to me that he may know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Elisha hears that the king tore his clothes. He sends to the king to tell him to have Naaman come to his home. But why he does this is interesting. Note that he doesn't say, have Naaman come so he can be healed. He didn't say that. What did he say? He said, have him come so that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. If you didn't know, Elisha means God is salvation. Wow, we're setting up for something, aren't we? God is salvation. That's interesting. So he, Elisha himself, he's demonstrated that God is using him for the miracles that he's worked through. I mean, if we look back when faced with a potential, I cannot talk. When faced with a potential disaster, Jehoshaphat summoned Elisha and he predicted a victory. In chapter 4, Elisha brought a dead boy back to life. So when we hear Elisha's name, we can see that God's about to do something really mighty. When Elisha's involved, God's about to work. If you look throughout the text, every time Elisha is involved, God's about to work. We even said earlier that God gave victory to Naaman to maybe set something up in his life for the future. Let's keep reading. Verse 9, so Naaman came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored and you shall be clean. So Naaman comes to the house. It says that he came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door. Now you can almost imagine this scene, right? You can imagine that Naaman lives in a very high society. He travels with pomp and circumstance. Horses and chariots are instruments of war. So you can imagine all these guys rolling into town with the thunder of horses and chariots. I mean, if you think about, like, if you ever seen a movie like Braveheart or something along those lines, when these guys walk all the metal clanks and they have the armor and you know, everything's making noise. And no, there's no doubt when these guys roll into town, 
Everybody's paying attention. There's no way around. He's coming with pomp and circumstance. He's the commander of the army. Everybody in town's paying attention at this point. And I don't really have a doubt that Naaman probably derived pleasure from arriving in such a grand style. But Elisha's not impressed by those horses and chariots. He's not impressed by Naaman's placement in life. Elisha knows that uh, Naaman and all of his servants are only drawing their next breath by God's good will. So Naaman shows up at Elisha's house, probably expecting Elisha to come up or come out and talk to him in person. There's all this pomp and circumstance. I mean, he's the commander of the Syrian army. In Naaman's mind, it's like, I'm the commander of the Syrian army. Why would Elisha not come out and talk to me? He's got to come be a part of our pomp and circumstance. I mean, I'm here. Let's do this thing. I brought money. Instead, he sends a messenger. He sends a messenger out to talk to him. And the messenger says, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored. Hmm. So Elisha gave him a very simple prescription for a major problem. A major problem. If Naaman would just go wash seven times in the Jordan, his leprosy would be cured. The single greatest problem he had in his life at the time would be gone. He would be clean again. He could see his family again. No more spending time quarantining and walking through the streets and saying, unclean, unclean, and having to tear his clothes and make sure everybody knew that he was a leper. Now, on a side note, in Hebrew culture, the number seven does have great symbolic value, right? I mean, God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, which made it holy. Um, the people were to observe the Sabbath, or the Sabbath day, or the seventh day and make it holy. There's even a cleansing ceremony in Leviticus 14 that talks about how the person with leprosy is to be sprinkled with the blood of a bird seven times, live outside their tent for seven days, and wash so they can become clean. So while there's nothing magical about the number seven, it's not surprising that Elisha told him to wash seven times. I don't think we should dwell upon the number seven as much, but it, it always get to have the context of what's going on there. Let's keep reading. Uh, verse 11. But Naaman was angry and went away saying, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call upon the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So at this point, one would think Naaman would be happy that he was given a simple prescription. He has a major problem. Hopefully, he would think he would recognize this major problem, recognize this is simple, I can do this. I can be clean. But no, it says he was angry at the response. Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Notice he said his God. Naaman does not recognize the God of Israel as legitimate at this point. At this point, he's still saying, that's his God, not mine. That's yours. We got our own gods. But if you're willing to heal me, like, I mean, okay, I got money. He thought he would come out and wave his hand and do some magical, you know, spiritual trick, and he would be healed. He expected big pomp and circumstance for an important guy. I mean, why wouldn't he expect this? He's paying a large sum of money for his, his healing, is he not? In his mind, he put forward his part. He put forward the money. Why can't Elisha? He even says in verse 12, Are not the Abana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Why did he need to travel all the way to Israel to wash in a river? He could have done that at home. Why did he need to bring all this money to Washington River? He could have saved the money. To him, it was too simple of a response to a major problem. In a sense, he was right. He could have stayed at home and tried to wash in the river. It wouldn't work. It wasn't God's will. It's the problem. The problem is it was not the will of God. We keep reading. So he turned away and went into a rage. Verse 13. But his servants came near and said to him, My father, it is a great word the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So Naaman walks away in a rage, and his servant comes to him and tries to change his mind. He said, my father, it is a great word. The prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Now, it, interesting enough, the CSB, some people read HCSB, CSB is a little bit newer, um, says, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he only tells you wash and be clean? The servant makes an excellent point. 
He comes to David and said, you have such a great problem. Would you not do anything to get rid of it, even if it was hard? And I should offer you something simple, and you won't do it. Naaman allowed his pride to take hold instead of embracing the cure that was handed to him because he made this more about him. Think about it. When he came, he's got all this pomp and circumstance. He brought the money. He's got a letter from the king. He shows up expecting Elijah to come out and do this little magical trick and heal him. It's all about him. His focus is all about him. He doesn't even recognize that the God of Israel is legitimate. He says, it's about me. Verse 14, so he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. And he was clean. So Naaman gives in and goes and washes in the Jordan. The text tells us that he washes seven times according to Elisha's word. And his flesh was restored like that of a child, and he was clean. This simple act of trust and obedience relieved the single greatest problem he faced. Not only was his leprosy gone, but he was clean. He could now be in the presence of others. He could see his family. He didn't have to be an outcast. He was no longer the target of disgust. That's big. That's a life change. That is like presenting a totally new life to Naaman. The target of disgust. Because you've got to think, nobody wanted to be around a, a leper. I don't want that. Stay away. Stay away. And it would be, I hate to say this. We do this in today's society, do we not? Somebody's sick, stay away, stay away, stay away. He's no longer the target of disgust. But let's read this next section. Verse 15. Then he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. What just happened? What just happened? Is this the same guy? Surely not. He comes back and stands before Elijah and says this. This was a man that used to worship multiple gods. Maybe in the series of events 20 minutes ago? Whoa. He came to Israel hoping to purchase his cleansing or salvation from leprosy. He came expecting it to be all about him. He came and was humble and came back to Elisha to express his gratitude and his faith in the one true God. It's almost like he came out of those waters a new person. Hmm, that sounds familiar. What just happened here? I really enjoyed reading this text um, this past week because it's just, it's such a cool text. And we sit here and we say, so what's the, the point of all of this? What's the point of reading this text? Why is this important to us? Because this is the perfect picture of salvation. This is the perfect picture of salvation. You see, we have a problem just like that of Naaman. We are all diseased. Every one of us. But ours is far worse. We saw that Naaman's disease could have been deadly. Leprosy, it can be deadly. If you don't treat it, I mean, even today's society, let's just take today's society. Somebody gets leprosy, this is still a thing. In many third world countries, somebody gets leprosy, slowly it starts to eat away, you know, maybe there's some amputations, infection can set in, and that can die. So there's a chance that you can die from leprosy. But the disease we bear promises death. And the death is not just physical. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. We deserve death for the sin that we commit. We deserve death for the sinners that we are. There's no way around that. The disease we bear is far greater. And I think we often forget as a Christian society just how great of a problem our disease is. If it weren't for this disease, if it weren't for our sin nature, none of us would be here right now because none of it would matter. If we weren't diseased, then why are we in church? You ever thought about that? Why are you here? Why are you here? If you're not diseased, then you don't need to be here. If you're not marred by sin, you don't need to be here. We don't need God. That's a strong statement, but it's true. 
It's true. If it weren't for sin, we don't need to be here. But you see, all of us are marred by sin. David in Psalm 51 tells us that we were in sin before we were ever even born. He said, in iniquity I was born. There are no exclusions. Romans 3, 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right before that, in verse 10, it says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Everyone bears this disease. Everyone in this room. Everyone. Everyone on this planet bears this disease. And we often downplay it. Like Naaman, this disease caused us to be an outcast, not from society, but from God himself. That's the trouble with sin. We are an outcast from God himself. God is holy. He is perfect. He cannot have sin in his presence. He's disgusted by sin. With this disease, we can't even be in his presence. And as a just God, sin must be punished. It is the single greatest problem that humanity has ever faced. And it is the single greatest problem that we will ever face. It is not famine. It is not war in Ukraine. It is not COVID. It is sin. Because even if you could solve all those other things, guess what's still a problem? Sin. We still are accountable to a holy and just God. We can't get around that, even if we say we don't believe that. We often downplay the severity of the problem we face, and when we downplay the severity of a problem, we downplay the response to it. Like Naaman, if we truly understood the severity of the problem we face, we would be willing to do anything to escape it. Anything. If we truly understood the, the, the problem that we face in sin, we would do anything to change it. Instead, we often take our faith as an add-on or addition to our lives. We don't take the disease seriously. We don't understand the weight of sin on our shoulders. We don't understand just what that means to a holy God. Holy means set apart. He's not like us. He's not of us. He's not sin. The problem is there's nothing you can do to escape this disease. There's nothing you can do to escape this disease. Naaman couldn't do anything to cure his own disease. I know that if he could, he would. He tried. He brought his money. He brought his pomp and circumstance. He was hoping that, you know, okay, I'll do all this. I'll bring the letter, and I'll bring the money, and I'll stand before the king, and there's some prophet there. Don't know his name, but he'll heal. It'll be fine. I don't have to do anything different. It'll be fine. We are marred by sin. We are diseased by sin. The unsaved human heart loves it. By nature, we love the very thing that God hates. And outside of Christ, we love the disease that will destroy us. That's a tough thing to think about. If you just sit back and just, just dwell upon this a second. Outside of God, outside of Christ, we love what he hates. Let that dwell within your heart. That should bring a, a, a fear to your heart. I'm not saying be fearful in the sense of, of fear of God. I want you to fear God, but not fearful of. But you should be in fear that by nature we love the very thing that God hates. So when we hear people talk about Jesus or about salvation, we immediately downplay it and think that salvation is about ourselves. We think it's something we can do, that we can be a part of, something that we deserve. We saw Naaman was focused all upon himself. He deserved the special treatment. He expected he would come and be healed and immediately go back to his old way of life. He even thought there was something he could do to contribute. The money. All the other things. But when he arrived, what did Elisha tell him to do? Go to the Jordan, wash and be clean. It's almost like Elisha said, go to the Jordan and trust upon the God of Israel, and you'll be clean. Notice Elisha never said, go wash in the Jordan, and I'll do something, and you'll be clean. He didn't say, hey, I put this magical stuff in the waters, and it'll be clean. He said, let him come that he may know there is a prophet in Israel. 
The purpose of a prophet is to make known the things of God. That's his goal. The purpose of Elisha was to make God known to Naaman. And when he came out of those waters, he was a new person. He recognized that his cleansing was solely by the grace of the God of Israel. And I can ensure you that he went home a new person. I can ensure you that he went home and did not go back to the same life he lived before. We can even see his desires change. It's not originally part of the text, but if you skip down, um, where is it at? Um, verse 18, he said, In this matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. What he's saying is, I'm going to have to go back to this temple. I'm going to have to go back to the temple of these other gods that are not the God of Israel. But I recognize that the God of Israel is the only true God. He even said that. He went home with new, a new person. He went home with new desires. We determine there's nothing we can do to save ourselves from this disease. It could be left there. That could be the end of the story. God is holy. God is just. He could close the book and say, you're a sinner. Too bad. He's able to do that. He's God. As a holy and righteous God, he can say, too bad. As a, as a human race, you have sinned against me. You have broken this relationship. You are marred by sin, and you deserve punishment, eternal separation from me, because I cannot have sin in my presence. He could say that. He's completely justified to say that. But there is a God who saves from this disease. There is a God who takes away its burdens. There is a God who has borne the punishment of our sins. And it is God himself who sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take it all. The God of the universe who hates your sin is the same one that sent his son to die for it. The God of the universe who is disgusted by the evil heart is the same God who gives you a new one. The God of the universe who hates the path of sin is the same God who will cause you to walk in his statutes. That is amazing grace. It's not logical. It's not logical for God to save us. It's not logical for God to send his son to die on the cross for us. It's not even plausible. If you think about it, the Bible just makes it very clear that outside of Christ, we are God's enemies because we desire the things he hates. Yet that same God is the same one that calls his enemies to be his children. That same God is the same one who sent his son to pay the brutal punishment of you. That you deserve. Here in a minute after the the after we worship, we're going to read Ezekiel 36. If you actually can, let's just turn to Ezekiel 36 now. Ezekiel chapter 36. We'll read it twice. It's always good to read the Bible twice. Let me start in verse 22. It says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit. And a new spirit I will put in with you, within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. God says it's not for our sake that he acted. He's acting for his glory. That is God's grace and sorrow his glory. But he loves his people as well. The love he has for his enemies is not logical. He said that he would sprinkle clean water on us and we would be clean. He said that he would give us a new heart. One that can respond to the things of God. If you think about it, 
A heart of stone can do nothing. A heart of stone can do nothing. Ephesians chapter 2 also said we were dead in our trespasses. He said he would take out the heart of stone that hates God and give us a new one. He would give us one that desires him, one that responds to him. He says he will give us a new spirit that is of him. And he says that he will cause us to walk in obedience. He says, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. And how does he tell us that we receive this gift? Well, when you look forward in the book, it's through Christ alone. It's through Christ alone. That same God is the same one that sent his son to die. He calls us to believe upon the work of Christ and repent of the sins that he so hates. He tells us to trust upon him, knowing that Christ is the only payment for our sins. He is the only cure for our disease. We are only cured through Christ. It doesn't matter who we are or how much money we have or what place we have in life. If you're the president or if you live on the streets, you can only be healed through Christ. God has given us a simple prescription for a major problem. The greatest problem that we'll ever face. So now the question is, are you in Christ? People say, wait, I don't hate God. I don't hate God. I don't hate God. But the actions of an unbeliever prove otherwise, do they not? We all hate God outside of Christ. We all... Whether you are a believer in here or not, we all once walked in opposition to Christ. All of us. And our actions prove that. Jesus himself said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. What I'm wanting is I want us to examine ourselves to see if we're walking in faith. He tells us, if you are a new person, Naaman came out of those waters a new person. He was not the same person that went back home. They probably didn't even recognize him. He didn't talk the same, didn't walk the same. You notice when he came, he was all pomp and circumstance. And he came back to Elisha and said, I know there's only one true God. He's the God of Israel. He's totally new. Christ himself said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Are you walking in obedience to Christ, trusting upon the payment that he's made for our sins? Because he tells us very clearly, if you say that you are my servant, if you say you are a believer, your life will look like that of a believer. We can't look like the world and keep living that old life if we say that we're a new person. We must examine ourselves, and this is not just for the unbeliever, this is for everybody. We examine ourselves every day to see if we are walking in obedience to Christ. The number one way we walk in obedience to Christ is trust upon him and repent of the sins that he so hates. That's it. It's a simple prescription. It's a simple prescription for the biggest problem you will ever face. Trust him. Because I have to trust that he will give us new hearts. I have to trust that he will cause us to walk obediently. Because nobody can make you do it. Nobody can make me do it. It's all Christ. It's all Christ. If you recognize, if you look at your life and say, wait, I'm not walking away. I've not trusted upon Christ. So trust now. That's it. Trust now. Trust in the fact that God, the God who hates your sin, is the same one that sent his son. That's it. Trust upon him. Turn away from the things he hates. Praise God. That's what it takes. That's what it takes. It's not this major solution. We don't have to bring our money. We don't have to bring the things that we want to put forward to it. We can put forward nothing. Christ put forward everything. Examine yourselves. Have you been washed? Have you been cleansed? Are you a new person? If not, trust today. Trust today. That's all the hope we have. It's the only hope we have for the biggest issue we will ever face, the biggest threat to mankind we will ever face. And praise God that there is a solution. Praise God there is a solution. Heavenly God, I praise your name, Lord, that you have, you've spoken through your word. I praise your name, Lord, that, that you sent your son. That you are the God who hates sin and still sent your son to adopt the people that you once called your enemies. Praise, praise your name, O oh God, that you, would, that you would do this. That you would send your son for people that hated you. 
Lord, I pray that you open our hearts. I pray that you open minds. I pray that you let us see your son, that you let us see the gift that you sent. Let us respond. Let us walk in repentance. Let us not walk in the way of the world, but let us trust upon you and turn away from the things that you so hate. Let the gospel reign true in our heart, O God. Help us to walk obediently. Help us to see your son and to turn away. And praise God for the way you've blessed us. Even if we are in famine or war, you have blessed us beyond measure through your son. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand if you're physically able to worship our Lord who deserves allegiance above all other? If you need to respond, I'd invite you to do so. Michael's down here. I'll be down here. If you need to talk with us afterwards, we'll be back over here in this area. And we'll sing this song together. His mercy is more. We'll have a time of prayer for our meal that we'll have today and a word of benediction from Ezekiel. We will be able to leave worshiping him as we love, serve, and go. We'll sing together. His mercy is more. <laughs> and sin. We are unclean, Lord. And by all accounts, those of us who are far from you are following the ruler of the air. We are by nature objects of your wrath. But God, but you, Lord, who is rich in mercy, have given us a new life. Not by anything that we have done, so that no man may boast, but only through the saving work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, 
May we be clean and may we be able to stand before you proclaiming your mercy and your goodness. I pray that now as we leave today that we'll leave in cleansing, Lord. May our hearts be renewed. May our stone, Lord, that we have in our hearts be flesh. Lord, if there is any evil deed among us, any untruth, any disgust that is before your throne, any way that is against you, Lord, against your commands, against who you are, may we repent. Trust in you. Lord, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, may they come to that knowledge. May they surrender their lives to you. May by that trust and their faith that they have in you alone make them clean. Father, I pray you bless the time of fellowship that we are about to have together. Bless the meal that we're about to enjoy. I look forward to this time. Lord, I'm thankful that our children get the opportunity to go to camp, to learn more about you, to have a great, sweet time together. We get an opportunity to support that as well, Lord, so thank you. So may you bless this time. Lord, may all praise be brought before your throne. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Maybe you're thinking, I, I got to get home, but I sure would like some of that food. They'll have to go place for you. So don't worry, you can get one of those. And you can do that, but let's say these words of benediction together. Again, if you need to pick up a piece of paper that will give you the motion that's being made for, from the property team for our business meeting next week, that'll be on the table behind us. But let's say these words together from the book of Ezekiel. I will sprinkle you clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness, and from all your idols I will says the Lord. Love, serve, and go. God really spoke for you today. It was great. Thank you. Thank you for serving you.